So, hi, I'm Guy Golan from the University of South Florida. I want to give you a little bit of background about the third person effect and its underlying mechanisms and so on. Um, as we previously discussed, the third person effect is one of the most researched and well-published theories of theoretical frameworks used in mass communication scholarship. And what we really like about the theory is that while it's been around for a long time, the body of literature on it continues to grow and expand. We're learning more and more every year with new research coming out from different perspectives. At the most basic level, the fundamental hypothesis of the third person effect is that people will perceive media content that is socially undesirable to have more influence on other people than it does on themselves. So in a classic sense of third person effect, people, you ask them, uh, are you influenced by pornography or by cigarette advertising or by gambling advertising? And people say, well, I'm not really influenced by it, but other people are much more influenced, right? So this um, component of the third person effect is referred to as third person perceptions, right? This is a perceptual component of the third person effect. And this hypothesis has been tested across nations, across cultures, across probably 50 or 60 case studies, again, ranging from alcohol, tobacco, advertising, hip hop, misogynistic hip hop, music, uh, Y2K virus back in 2000s, for those of you who remember that, Holocaust denial, I mean, there are so many case studies, and again, over and over, the third person perception, perceptual component uh, holds water, stands, people tend to overestimate influence on others than on themselves. When you think about the third person effect, the perceptual component, you must remember that ultimately, what will uh, ultimately predict the amount of third person gaps between self and others is uh, the social desirability of a message. So if you ask people, for example, um, are bullying videos, right, on YouTube a good thing or a bad thing, I think most people will say these are terrible things, they're socially undesirable. These are harmful to other people, right? When we talk about, again, uh, pornography, violence on television, the research shows over and over, these are seen, perceived by most people as socially undesirable. But what happens when a message is socially desirable? For example, public service announcements, right? Or educational materials, right? Things that are beneficial to society. Are they also going to produce third-person perceptions? The answer is no. According to the research, most at most times, this as socially desirable media content will produce reversed third-person perceptions, also known as first-person perceptions. So, if you hear the term first-person effect, you're essentially um, describing a phenomenon in which people overestimate the amount of influence that socially desirable media messages will have on themselves while underestimating how much it's going to influence other people. So again, when it comes to the perceptual component of the third person effect, the more socially undesirable, the greater the TPP, third person perceptions, right? With people overestimating influence on others and less themselves, and when it comes to socially desirable messages, we're talking about first person effect, people thinking that they're gonna be more influenced than others. Why is this? Well, according to the literature, there are several explanations, one of which, and one of the more common ones, is ego enhancement, all right? We uh, sort of view ourselves as uh, a little bit better than other people on some issues, and we say, you know, I, I have a strong uh, moral foundation, I'm media literate, I'm intelligent, therefore I'm not going to be influenced by these social and desirable messages. However, other people, well, they're not as great as I am, right? They're more susceptible, therefore they're more likely to be right? There is one type of media content that falls somewhere in the middle. What about advertising? Do you think that Advertising will produce third-person perceptions or first-person perceptions. 
is advertising in general. I'm not talking about advertising of controversial products like cigarettes, tobacco, or cigarette, tobacco, whatever, right? Um, alcohol, gambling, but rather just brand advertising. Is that going to produce first person or third person effects? Those of you who think first person, raise your hand in the classroom watching. And those of you who think uh, third person, raise your hand again. Okay, interesting. So, what we know from uh, an early study by Guthrie and Thorson is that the very fact that people perceive advertising as a persuasive kind of media message, that will make them view it as socially undesirable. So uh, there is a hypothesis called the persuasion knowledge model that says that when people recognize an attempt to be uh, persuasion, they put up guards and say, hey, hold on, don't try to persuade me, right? So because of that, oftentimes, and some of the research has found that advertising messages yields third person perceptions. Okay, so those, that's the first part of the third person. Another thing to remember when thinking about third person is that it doesn't take place necessarily at the individual level always. Sometimes we view perceived media effects in the prism of <coughs> in-group, out-group identification, right? So a lot of research on social identification theory tells us that individuals view themselves as a part of a larger group, and this group membership is going to be very important, very salient in different times. One of the things we know is that just like we view ourselves as a little bit better than other people, oftentimes individuals perceive their own group to be a little bit better, right, than other groups. So now, instead of saying, talking about ego enhancement, we're talking about group ego enhancement, right? So uh, there was a study that I once conducted that looked at our religiosity. And what we found is that the more religious people were, the more likely they were to think that they're less susceptible and that other people who are religious are less susceptible to morally controversial media messages than those who are not religious, right? And the understanding is that those who are perceived to have a strong moral uh, foundation, again, religious people, are going to be less susceptible than uh, secular people, right, who those religious people thought were more, less morally grounded and less, and therefore more susceptible. So research on social distance helps us explain why sometimes we overestimate media effects when it comes not only to the individual, but to members of in-groups and out-groups. And this, is, um, as this has been tested in a variety of cases, looking at age, for example. So we know that people perceive adolescents or teenagers to be much more susceptible than adults. But this has also been uh, tested and supported uh, when it comes to different education levels, uh, people who live in different kind of cities, uh, religious, ethnic, racial groups, uh, partisan groups, and so on. So a very interesting and very fascinating line of research within the third person. Next, there's another predictor of the amount of third person effect, and this is perceived reach of the message, right? Perceived exposure. We often think that more, some groups or some individuals are going to be more likely to see a media message than others, right? So for example, if you look at violent video gaming, it's very likely that most of us will perceive teenagers to be more likely to be exposed to the message, therefore more likely to be susceptible to those kind of messages. The same can be applied in the world of politics where people may perceive uh, people in certain uh, partisan groups to be more likely to see certain kind of um, political messages. So for example, conservative talk radio, and therefore more likely to be influenced than people who are liberal, and therefore will not likely be exposed to um, talk, conservative talk radio. All right, so that's the first component of the third person, the perception. But next comes the very, very um, interesting and actively developing line of research called research on the behavioral component of the third person. And research on behavioral component asks the big question, and that is, so what? 
so what if I'm gonna overestimate media effects on others, right? So what if there is a perceptual gap between self and other groups, in group and in group? And the answer is that perceived media influence has real life consequences. This actually opened the door to a new theoretical stream presented by Al Gunther, known as the influence of presumed media influence, uh, a very interesting line of research that's very much developing. There are three key consequences to uh, third-person truth or third-person perception. The first one is the one that's most widely tested and supported, and that is support for restrictive action. When people perceive socially undesirable media content to have a great influence on others, they're likely to want to protect those people, right? So if we think about, again, pornography, gambling ads, cigarette ads, uh, drug ads, alcohol ads, we, we're saying, oh my God, I'm not going to be influenced, but other people are going to be influenced, right? Teenagers, people who are less uh, educated, people who have uh, lower moral fiber, we have to protect them. And the real life consequence of this kind of perceptions is often uh, in the form of support for government restrictions, government regulations, and censorship, right? So if I think other people are gonna be influenced in a negative manner, I may support restriction or censorship of this kind of content. And this is really where early research on the behavioral component of the third person effect came into play with a lot of research. Two other areas of research that are currently really being looked at, and there's a lot of opportunity over here for young scholars, people writing their thesis, dissertations, early scholars, right, are not from their looking at the restrictive, restrictive consequences, but rather looking at two others. The first one is corrective action. What is corrective action all about? Let's take a look at uh, media bias as an example. Oftentimes, people perceive the news media to be biased against one group or another, right? So people who watch MSNBC, who are conservatives, are going to say, hey, this is biased against our position. And people who are liberal, who watch Fox News, are going to say the media is biased in this circumstance, right? So hostile media perceptions and perceptions of media bias can often lead, right, to people saying, oh my God, this can really influence other people. We should do something about it. Now, can you uh, write a letter to your Congress uh, woman and say, please censor Fox News or MSNBC? Well, you can, but it's not going to be fruitful, right? But what, what else can you do? Well, you can take action. For example, a new line of research looks at social media activism, right? Where people take action to correct. So maybe I'm not going to be able to restrict Fox News or MSNBC, but I can definitely go on their posts and leave a comment that will provide alternative information, correct? And by doing so, I will correct the, the social undesirability of their media content, right? I will fix it. I will inform other people to protect them from this. So if I perceive, for example, fake news out there, right? I may be able to uh, create content that will counter the fake news or identify the fake news source, right? So. Moving away from just restricting content towards taking action to correct something, right, is one of the interesting outcomes of the behavioral component of the third person effect. Finally, there is one more area that's really growing right now, and that is what happens when there is a first person effect? What if I view the news at the media content to be socially desirable? Well, if it's socially undesirable and I want to restrict it, what would be the opposite? Perhaps I would like to promote it, right? So if I see a video that is really wonderful, that will make the world better. For example, philanthropy video, fundraising video, a deeply emotionally uh, you know, video to help children, help the needy, help the poor, right? And I'm like, wow, this is wonderful. Let's spread this around. So the promotional action as a consequence of the third person effect, or rather the first person effect, is an area that now is growing in uh, scholarly attention. This also brings us to the point of how does this really matter to marketers, 
right? If we can demonstrate as advertisers, as public relation practitioners, as marketers, to audiences that this perceived information, right, can have a strong influence on individuals, right? This perceived influence may yield promotional consequences, right? So if I watch a video, I'm like, I'm gonna be influenced by this. Most other people may not be as influenced as I am, but they should be. I'm more likely to do what? Reshare, retweet, right? Repost on my YouTube account, and essentially promote through social media channels. This is a really interesting area of research that is now growing in the behavioral consequences of the third person. One last note on this uh, growing area, research on the influence of presumed influence expands the uh, outcomes of perceived media effects. Here, the focus is not as much on how much am I influenced versus other people, but rather simply looking at how much do we think other people are gonna be influenced by media messages and what kind of real life consequences will these uh, perceived media influences have on real life behavior. And we have seen that such perceptions may have uh, such consequences as the willingness of scientists, for example, and academics to appear in news media uh, reports, right? We've seen research that indicates that politicians who perceive media to be, have influence on other people may be more likely to engage with the news media. We've seen research that shows that perceived media influence can influence people's residential mobility and even likelihood to engage in fundraising, to give blood, right? We have so many examples. So I hope this short tutorial kind of introduced everybody to what the third person effect is, some of the psychological mechanisms that underline the effect, and the real life consequences of third person perceptions. And I strongly encourage young scholars and graduate students to consider the third person effect as a theoretical framework for your own research. I'm Guy Golan, and I hope to hear from you. I hope this helped you. Have a great day.